such a treat it is to spend this time together with our community, isn't it? So before I start, I want to say that events like this only happen because there are so many volunteers. Uh, the volunteers, the conference organizers, uh, the IXDA board members, the local and regional leaders, they give us all the gift of their time and their skills. So please join me in giving them your biggest football cheer. Right? <laughs> Woo! Yes. Yeah. Because the speakers, we just show up and talk to you for an hour. Those are the folks who actually hold our community together. And you know, when I think about where the community has been and where it started, it's incredible that IXDA is 100,000 people now. There's almost 2,000 of us here today. When it was just about 20 years ago that we even started calling it interaction design. Before that, we usually called it user-centered design, human-centered design. We hadn't really conceived of ourselves as that separate. But we started to realize that we wanted to differentiate ourselves from other design disciplines because software had behavior. It was a conversation. It was different from graphic design and industrial design. And yet, we were sort of different from the HCI crowd. We, we wanted to distinguish ourselves from that more academic point of view and really ground ourselves in design. And so from that, I think our identity as a community emerged, our identity as interaction designers. But then after a while, I think some people started to get discontent and realize that you know, everything we were doing was still pretty much on a screen, and it's bigger than that. As Rama was just saying, we wanted to design user experiences. We knew that it was an end-to-end -end thing that we really wanted to be responsible for, and so we took on this kind of grandiose title. We designed the whole experience, and we started to claim that for ourselves. And then we spent the next 12 years on Twitter arguing about whose job title was more important, which kind of design included the other kinds of design, we're the umbrella term, which is the one discipline to rule them all, to use Mark's phrase from yesterday. And then of course it gets to be an even more fun day on Twitter when somebody says, everybody's a designer. Uh, if you follow English language Twitter at all, it really blows up when that happens. So, you know, some days I open my Twitter feed and I think, oh, I wish I hadn't. Oh, I love design Twitter, and yet some days you want to beat your head against a wall, right? Look, I, I understand why people get sensitive about this idea that everyone is a designer, because it, it feels like it devalues our work, doesn't it? We've worked hard to build our skills, and for those of us who've been around a long time, we've worked hard to carve out that space for ourselves in our companies and with our clients and to define a field. And so it feels like a bit of a personal attack when somebody says, yeah, everybody's a designer now. Like, whoa, whoa, what about me? That doesn't feel good. So I understand that, I do. Um, and some people raise, I think, legitimate concerns about people who call themselves designers and maybe don't really know what they're doing because those people can do a bad job and sort of leave us a mess to clean up, right? People get a bad impression of what designers do. Oh, they just make the pixels pretty, uh, you know, or they, or they do bad design and we think, oh, that's gonna leave folks with a bad impression of what designers do. And so we worry about that, and that's understandable too. But here's the thing. When we talk about designing a user experience, that's not made of pixels, or CSS, or words, or wireframes, or workflows. A user experience is not just made of the stuff that we do. A user experience is made of decisions, hundreds of decisions made by lots of different people who are not us, right? Decisions about the revenue model. That's probably the most important design decision anybody in the company makes that has the biggest impact. Decisions about software performance. That's user experience. Decisions about security, about pricing, about support. Decisions about how we market the product and set expectations. All of that is user experience creation, whether those people have design skills or not. We all know frontline customer service staff create user experience every day. If that flight attendant on my United flight is grumpy today, I'm not flying the friendly skies. Of course, we joke about them in the United States being the unfriendly skies anyway. Um, so frontline staff create user experience with every decision they make, and the way we treat those employees creates their good mood or their bad mood, right? That's what Mark was talking about with service design yesterday. It's a holistic system. And we all know what happens when the lawyers get involved with experience design, right? 
Ugh, that is never a good scene, ever. Right, so we can all laugh, right? Because the lawyer thing is kind of funny. Funny, not funny. But the fact is, the lawyers will always make design decisions. That's just life. That's always going to happen. And the more complex the problems we deal with get, the more different skill sets are gonna be involved in making those decisions. And you know what, when we're solving complex things like healthcare or, you know, democracy, yeah, we need a lot of people's expertise that goes beyond ours. So all of those other people are making, better, are making design decisions, they're just often not making very good ones. So I think we got it a little bit wrong in the 90s when we said we want to be about interaction design or all those other flavors of design that we talk about. I think we got a little obsessed that design was the important word. I actually think it's the human-centered part that really was what mattered, and I think we've lost sight of that a little bit. Because really, it's about this set of values that we share, right? So I love hanging out with my tribe, and I think of the IXDA folks as my tribe in terms of our origins, right? Because we, we come from a shared set of perspectives and experiences. But if we think about defining our tribe based on our skills, and you get to be in the tribe because you have the right skill set, and you don't get to be in the tribe because you don't, that cuts out a lot of people that we need to solve the complex problems. We need people who know how government works to help us design better democracies. We need people who know how healthcare works, right? We don't have all the answers. And somebody in one of the questions yesterday said, yeah, as designers, don't we have a savior complex sometimes? Yeah, we, we sometimes do. And so I define my tribe a little differently these days. I define it a bit more broadly. If you are here to make the world suck less for humans, you are part of my tribe. If you are here and you share this mission, you are part of my tribe, whether you have any design skills or not, right? That's how I think of it. So my job is to help other people make better decisions that are more human-centered for more people. So I doubt many of you would argue that, that that's really our mission, right? We're here to make things better. That's why we get out of bed in the morning. That's what gets us to the office on Monday morning. So I guess I have to ask, how well are we doing if this is what we think our mission is? Are we making the world better? Well, let's see. I'm sure we can all point to some products and services that do. If you think about the fact that you have a, a map and a GPS in your pocket, that enables freedom that a lot of us couldn't enjoy at one point because we didn't know where we were going. Think about the fact that technology lets a lot of people work from anywhere, define their own work hours, be really flexible, that's empowering for a lot of people. That's an improvement in their quality of life. Oh, that's not an improvement in my quality of life. There we go. Um, okay. Uh, think about online shopping. For many of us, it's just a convenience. But for some people, it means independence. If you're somebody who can't move around much outside your home, you can get just about anything delivered to your door, even really weird stuff sometimes. And uh, think about social networks at their best. Right? There are social networks that will let people with rare diseases find each other and learn from each other when they might not ever have met a patient with their disease before. This is all amazing stuff that I think as an industry we can be really proud of. But let's be honest. A lot of the stuff we all design also erodes quality of life in some ways, sometimes, right? Sometimes that's in minor annoying ways, attention theft. Man, our products are needy. They're demanding whiny things sometimes. Look at me. I have a thousand notifications for you to pay attention to. Or those emails that beg you to come back. We haven't seen you in a while, Kim. Come on back. We need to improve our engagement numbers, please. We want you to buy things. That's not about me as a user, right? That's about the company's needs. Is that really human-centered? Not really. But OK, maybe it's just annoying. So maybe it's not such a big deal. But. We have negative consequences sometimes that are bigger than just annoying. There's an increasing number of studies that talk about how using the internet affects us, how it affects our mental health. And there's a lot of evidence that there's a strong correlation between time spent online, not even with a particular product, but time spent online generally, having negative effects, making people more depressed, more anxious, even increasing suicidality. Wow. 
There's even some new studies, a bit preliminary, that seem to show a causal link between these two, not just correlation, but that more social media use is actually increasing these negative symptoms. Whew, that doesn't sound very human-centered to me. And you know, we talk about being user-centered, we actually need to think beyond the impact on just the person using our software. I agree with Rama on this point, right? It's, uh, it's about being centered on people and humans, not just the ones who use our, our products and services. Think about the fact that maybe you're designing an ad targeting platform for marketing people. Well, the way in which you let them target ads, maybe it discriminates against somebody in terms of jobs or housing, right? Maybe you're enabling some bad behavior that you might not think about if you don't think about the consequences for those other people. And we've all heard these stories, right? The ways that social media is increasing divisiveness. Uh, it's making us be our worst selves with each other. It's even inciting violence. There's a lot of evidence that some bad stuff is going on with our social networks because they're driving us to ever more biased content. There's, uh, there's some indication that YouTube, for example, their algorithm, because it's driving engagement, is actually driving people toward more and more extremist content. If you watch something political that leans one direction or the other, the next thing it recommends for you will be a little more extreme on that spectrum, and then a little more extreme than that, and then a little more extreme than that and, until you're really in the crazy, right? And so this is starting to show people a lot of very extreme content. But does this mean Dr. Evil is making our product decisions? Does this mean that, that these companies are evil? I don't think so, for the most part, maybe an exception or two. What I think is actually going on is at YouTube, for example, someone said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could put cat videos and how-to videos on the internet for free? That sounds like a good idea, right? And somebody said, yeah, you know, we could do that for free if we supported it with ads. Okay. Well, how do we make money selling ads? Oh, well, we, we drive up the engagement metric. That's the metric we need, right? That all sounds good so far. And then somebody decided how the algorithm should work in order to drive the engagement. And all of a sudden, you start to see where things are going wrong. So there's a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think that's often the case in our organizations. So I think there are two reasons that we, as designers and as organizations, struggle with making the right decisions. One is I think we are sailing around without a chart. We're navigating in waters we don't know. Because the technology is changing so fast, we don't know where all the reefs and the hidden dangers are, are lurking under the water. Back in the 90s when we developed most of our design methods that we use today, our problems were not this complicated. You make a piece of software that serves a user's goal, it's not connected to anything else, it's not collecting data, boom. All, you're good, you made it easier, yeah you. It's not that simple anymore. There are a lot of things that we trip over. One of those hazards that we don't really know how to navigate yet is data collection. We can collect unprecedented amounts of data right now. I'm wearing a watch, I bet a lot of you are wearing some kind of a fitness tracker. Well, you're telling a company not just where you are and how active you are and how much you sleep. Depending on when you wear your watch, they might know a lot more about your sex life than you realize. Hmm. Okay, is that okay to collect? I don't know. Nobody ever asked us if they could collect, us, collect that, but they do. What methods of data collection are okay? Is it okay to collect data from our watches? Is it okay to collect data from where our smartphone is going or from what stores we enter uh, and, and use that proximity data? Is that acceptable? What if you buy a new television? Is it okay for your television to report on your behavior to some third party without talking to you about it? We don't have the tools to decide that right now. All we have is maybe that sort of squishy gut feeling to say, are, are we sure we wanna do this? And then somebody says, yeah, it's fine. Apple, um, if you have uh, an iPhone and I leave you a voicemail, you can send that recording to Apple so that they can improve their transcription service. Sounds harmless enough. But what if I'm telling you something really sensitive in that voicemail? Well, Apple thinks they've got you covered because they say, would this person be okay with you sharing their voicemail or not? Is that okay to collect that data from a third party? We don't have the system to help us figure that out. What uses of data are, are okay? 
Facebook asks for your phone number for authentication and then uses it for ad targeting. Is that acceptable? Is it okay for Google to use the contents of your email to figure out what you might be interested in advertising about? Mind you, all these platforms send me some seriously weird ads, so I'm not convinced this AI stuff is really working so well. No. Um, Target stores in the United States, this is a, a big sort of inexpensive department store chain, uh, had a lot of press a couple of years back for using big data to figure out, oh, you know, when women buy lots of lotion, they might be pregnant. And then they started sending people ads for, you know, diapers. Sometimes before those women had told their families, for example. Is that acceptable, use of data? We don't know. We don't have tools for this. And increasingly, as we use machine learning, we're starting to leave decisions to computers. What decisions are acceptable for a computer to make? And how do we avoid the bias, right? We heard a bit about AI earlier. How do we avoid taking the bias that already exists in us as humans and making that worse by making it an algorithm? And how do we see that? These are all hazards that our tools do not tell us how to handle. And I think the biggest hazard of all, in some ways, is about influencing behavior. When I first started designing stuff in the 90s, influencing user behavior was never something we thought about. It was always, what is the user's goal? How can I help them accomplish that more efficiently? The end. It wasn't, how do I get them to click the buy button, right? Uh, it wasn't that. Now, I think all of us can agree that there are some uses, uses of behavioral design that are worthwhile. Every now and then, my Apple Watch says, hey, stand up, walk around. You've been sitting on your rear end too long. That's good. That's healthy for me. So I am OK with that kind of behavioral influence as a user. Well, is it OK for Uber to use behavioral science to influence the behavior of its drivers? When is it OK? When is it not OK? When is it OK for us to say, yeah, we're going to use some behavioral design techniques to get more data out of you, more private information, to get you to click the buy button, to get you to opt into that warranty that maybe will be useful for you but is rather expensive. When is that acceptable? It's hard to have these conversations because all we have to go on is our gut feelings. So that's one problem. That's one reason we make bad decisions. The second problem is that I think if we are honest with ourselves, Many of us are not really practicing human-centered design. We're practicing metric-centered design. You know what I mean. Somebody says, this is the metric we want to move. And so we say, all right, we're going to do some experiments. We're going to design some things. We're going to measure it, maybe do an A-B test, see what works. And then if we move the metric, we are going to publicize the crap out of that, right? And we should, because that's how we gain more resources. That's how we get credibility. We need metrics. Because they give us feedback. They tell us if what we're doing is accomplishing the business goals. And they give us political cover. So we're not going to get rid of metrics, and I'm not being anti-metric. But there's a problem with metrics, OK? Metrics are kind of like RNA in the body, if you remember back to high school biology class, right? RNA is the substance in our bodies that tells our cells what proteins to make, in what sorts of quantities, at what times. RNA regulates the biological processes. And so when RNA is healthy, it's all good. Our bodies work like incredible machines. If our RNA gets broken, some bad stuff happens, right? This is when you get cancer and systemic disease because the cells start to overproduce the wrong proteins. They go crazy. You get uncontrolled cell division. And when we over-optimize to a metric, we also get a kind of disease. We start to get out of control. Because when you think about the way we make decisions in real life, we're, don't, we're not focused on one metric to the exclusion of all else, right? Let's say that my goal in life is to be as fit as possible. Well, I'm going to weigh that against something, right? My desire to, I don't know, watch Game of Thrones, or spend time with my family, or have that piece of chocolate cake, right? There are certain things I'm not going to give up in order for, for me to be as fit as possible, right? There's a boundary there that I create. And we're often not doing this in our organizations. Uh, Azo Raskin did an interview with the BBC last summer, this past summer. And he was talking about uh, the invention of infinite scroll on Facebook, you know, that thing that just keeps you flicking through the feed forever and ever and ever. And he said, when you put that much pressure on one number, the engagement metric, you're going to start trying to invent new ways of getting people to stay hooked. 
Do we think it's okay when we talk about what we do using the language that drug dealers use? <laughs> funny, not funny, right? Not, not really okay with me. Maybe it's okay with some of us. Um, but I think it's a problem, right? It indicates that we're over-optimizing to that metric. And I think we sometimes know that. But how do we argue against it, right? How do we start to build uh, that conscience in our organizations? Because it's tempting sometimes, when we're rewarded for that metric, to maybe use that dark pattern. Maybe we put an opt-out checkbox instead of an opt-in, because, well, it's just the agreement to send email, right? So it's not really doing a lot of harm. Uh, maybe we bury the costs a little later in the process. Maybe we collect a credit card for a free trial, but uh, we forget to make sure the marketing team is going to send an email that says, by the way, we're about to charge your credit card, and somebody hopes they forget, and, and we charge their credit card, right? Um, this screenshot is actually from my Sonos stereo system at home. I bought the speakers, installed them. They did a software update that says, gosh, you literally cannot use your speakers anymore until you give us your email address. Hmm, okay. Is this acceptable? <sighs> Being human-centered is hard. I think as designers, we sometimes believe that we are inherently human-centered. I'm a designer, therefore, I have the corner on the human-centered thing. Not true. It does not come for free with your design job title. Being human-centered is a daily practice, kind of like eating well and exercising, right? We know it's a thing we want to do, we value it, but sticking to it is hard because we have all of these competing pressures. So how do we help ourselves make good decisions and help everybody around us make better decisions? Well, I have a couple of strategies I'd like to suggest for you. One is that we be explicit about what human-centered means. Now, I know we all get tired of defining the damn thing, but how often have you actually talked about what human-centered is? We say it's a good thing. I have yet to actually hear a decent definition of what this is. You might have a different definition than I do. So, I'd like to propose something as a starting point, maybe, if it could work. I find it useful. Um, actually, I put this in here just because it's an example. I know there was a designer involved in this thing. This is a set of blinders for people who, wear, uh, who work in open offices and cubicles. Right? It's noise-canceling headphones and blinders. And somebody thinks this is improving quality of life for office workers. This is design enabling something that just is broken in the first place, right? There's a point at which we are, uh, we're supporting bad design instead of actually improving. So I think that if we want to agree on what human-centered is, I would suggest starting with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'll briefly explain it. So Maslow says, in order to achieve our full potential as human beings, what he calls self-actualization, big word, but achieving your potential, First, we need physiological needs. We need food, we need sleep, we need water, right? If any of these are not present, we're not going to be able to improve as human beings because these are too fundamental. We can't worry about anything else if these are a problem. Once we have those nailed, safety and shelter, right? We need a roof over our heads. We need to feel like no one's going to attack us. Once those are met, then we can move on. And the next most fundamental need is love and belonging, a sense that we're part of a community that values us, that we belong somewhere, kind of like we all belong in this room today, right? Uh, we don't need to get into love, but, but we all belong here in some way that's meaningful to us, right? And so we need that. We also need a sense of esteem, that we are valued by other people and that we value ourselves. And if all of that is in place, then we can work toward our full potential as humans. So that's the basic idea of Maslow's hierarchy. And to my mind, this is a pretty good basis for evaluating if we are human-centered, which is this. If your product or service is human-centered, I would argue that it supports at least one of Maslow's needs for somebody, and, and, not or, and, it doesn't undermine any of those needs for anybody. And this is how we get to be human-centered and not just user-centered, right? Because we need to look at those unintended consequences. So how can we do good for somebody and no harm to anybody else? So let's look at an example. Home automation, right? If I think about the ability to, you know, turn on my coffee machine with my phone or flip a light switch without walking across the room, for me, 
that doesn't really hit anywhere on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's not gonna help me self-actualize. Uh, and honestly, it's just gonna help my butt get bigger because I'm not getting out of a chair, right? It's actually better for me to get up and turn on the light switch. But if you're somebody who has a mobility challenge, for example, being able to do those things independently, yeah, that's Maslow's hierarchy right there. Independence helps you feel better about yourself, helps you feel more functional, lets you focus on other things besides just getting your cup of coffee made, right? So that's good. But here's the downside. Here's the unintended consequence part. It turns out that there's always a subset of humans who are really good at being awful to other humans. And this is a thing we just need to design for. So it turns out that a lot of these home automation systems, domestic abusers are finding ways to use those against their victims. So they're doing things like locking their spouses out of control of the lights. So the lights are on all night. Or letting people not control the heat. They're affecting their ability to have safety and shelter. Or they're setting off loud alarms in the middle of the night. They're hitting at a level of physiological needs, depriving people of sleep. So, if you're the product manager for this product, where does dealing with this fall in your product roadmap? If you're being human-centered, it's at the top of the list, because you're undermining fundamentals in Maslow's hierarchy for somebody. Now, this can be a tough sell in your organization. So it's not enough that we just agree on what human-centered needs, what human-centered means. We have to take another step beyond that. Second step I think we need to take as an industry is to adopt something like the Nuremberg Code to help keep us honest, to help guide our behavior. Because just agreeing on human-centeredness doesn't really get us there. If you're not familiar with the Nuremberg Code, um, this is something that emerged out of the Nuremberg trials, where the world learned just what kind of awful stuff the Nazi doctors were doing to people in the name of medical research. And so if you've ever done any medical research, or you've done any sort of human subjects research in an academic setting, you have had to submit your work to something called an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. This is a group of people who may be from your field, but also include the folks who would be your research subjects. And by the way, subjects is a word I hate. Um, participants is a better one. So this includes a wide variety of people who look at your work, and they will ask you several very hard questions that are derived from the Nuremberg Code. The reason I suggest the Nuremberg Code is relevant to our work is because the internet, in my view, is the largest human subjects experiment ever done in the history of humanity. And it is mostly unconsented. Think about it. We are systematically collecting data about people in a lot of ways. We are, in many cases, running experiments to try to manipulate their behavior. And we're measuring that, and we're drawing conclusions from it. And for the most part, they have no idea this is going on. How does that not fall under human subjects research guidelines? And yet, we don't, we don't govern ourselves in that way. So if our work went in front of an IRB, they would say first, what is the benefit to your users or to society? Or is this just about your profit? If we can't identify some way in which it's beneficial to our users or other humans, game over, right? Is this way of doing it the only way to learn what we need to learn? Is there some lower risk way that we could go about doing that? Is the risk to the user proportional to the benefit that they get? Not the benefit we get, but the benefit they get. So for example, I'm often in an airport or someplace that wants my name and email and my date of birth and like the middle name of my firstborn child and my address, just to use Wi-Fi. Yeah, not worth the trade-off, right? Uh, by the way, I'm pretty sure all of us lie on those things. Um, so that wouldn't pass an IRB either. An IRB is also going to ask you what kinds of harm are possible. Who might have some negative impact from this? So we don't have this built into our processes as designers. Medical researchers have this as a forced step to deliberately imagine all of the harms that could happen. And it's not enough that they have a list of those harms. They have to have a plan and the resources to mitigate those harms, right? They have to say, these are the things that could happen, and here's what we're going to do if they do. So they essentially do some disaster planning up front. So just imagine some of the software products we see out there had to do this. I think those products might be a little different. 
So let's look at this Uber driver manipulation thing. If our question is, is this feature of benefit to the user, well, then we can start to have a meaningful conversation. Well, if manipulating driver behavior only improves our bottom line and might cost drivers money, mm, yeah, that's not good. If we find a way to make that a win-win, that we make more profit and maybe they can make more money or have greater control or, or some other benefit, ah, okay, that starts to look like a more even an exchange. That starts to look potentially ethical, right? What are the risks to them? How do we reduce those? There was an article a while back about Roomba, robotic vacuums, and the company was planning on selling the floor, pl floor plans that your vacuum makes to third parties. They changed their plans, because when this got out in the media, people said, what? How does this benefit me? Now, if they had had a conversation internally in this IRB framework, yeah, that never would have even gone out to the press. They, they would have killed that idea, because there's just no benefit to the people who bought the Roomba to having their floor plan sold. Okay. Perhaps the most important principle from the Nuremberg Code is that of informed consent. And I mean truly informed, not, yeah, there's a giant 16-page terms and conditions thing that we have an opt-out checkbox for. No, no. Informed consent means people are likely to understand this. It's pre been presented in a way that is clear, absorbable, and in fact, in clinical trials, often there is a quiz. If a patient signs up for a clinical trial, a researcher says, here are the bad things that might happen. Is this okay? Do you understand these risks, right? And there will be a couple of questions that the patient has to answer to demonstrate their understanding even. Now, I'm not saying we need to go that far, but if our standard is, yeah, people are actually likely to, to read this and absorb it and understand it, that starts to tell us we need to present terms and conditions very differently than we do today. Consent also can't be coerced. So this is why uh, things like experiments on a prison population are not okay. Uh, because pe people can't really opt out of those very easily. They will feel pressured into it. And so where are the settings where if you have a service that is basically a public utility, people can't not use it? Are your terms and conditions coercive in those circumstances? Sometimes yes. And very important, consent has to be able to be withdrawn at any time. Now, if you've looked at GDPR in Europe, some of these things will look familiar from that. GDPR, I don't think, goes far enough, and I think people are implementing the letter of the law rather than the spirit, uh, based on what I've seen. In some cases, it's making user experiences even clumsier. But if we start this as our framework for discussion and say, are we doing these things? Well, if the discussion is that we don't want to do these things, uh, that's maybe something we should talk about too, right? So if you're Mattel and you're thinking of making a Barbie doll that records the conversations of a small child so that Barbie can talk back to them, and you're sharing those conversations with third parties. Is consent informed and voluntary? Small children cannot consent on privacy issues. They do not have the mental framework for that. No IRB in the world will let that go. What about this thing that Apple does where, you know, I can leave you a message and you can send that to Apple? This actually passes the legal standard in the US because if one person in a conversation consents, generally that's considered acceptable. I don't really think it passes the ethical standard though because the person whose, email, whose voicemail you're sending hasn't had an opportunity to be informed or to consent. So I don't think this would pass either. Now, some of these we can look at as corporate decisions that are made by people other than us, but let's look at our own practices for a minute. If you've ever used session replay, well, first, let's say what session replay is. On a website, you can go in and look at the individual browsing session of a specific user. And lots of tests are showing that these supposedly anonymized sessions are not really very anonymous. In fact, people can be re-identified pretty easily and can even reveal credentials like bank logins and so on. So think about somebody watching you browse around the website and you know, shop for potentially embarrassing personal products, for example. Do you have any idea that this is going on as a website user? I don't think so. Is consent informed and voluntary? Hmm. It's a good question for us, isn't it? The third thing I think we need to do, and this is a thing that I think we can all do starting tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's Sunday. Monday, then. I think we need to change how we relate to metrics. 
I'm not anti-metrics. We need metrics. Metrics are good. But we're using them wrong. So there's a phrase in lean product management about being data-driven. Oh, I hate that phrase. Let's not be data-driven. Data is mindless. It has no moral compass. Don't let it make the decisions. It's an idiot. We need to make the decisions. Instead, I would propose a different approach. First, let's be focused on goals. Let's be guided by our values. Put some guardrails around those. And let's be data informed about both of those things. So when I talk about goals, I'm talking about the business outcome we hope to, be, we hope to achieve. We often confuse this with the metric, but they're not the same thing. If we think engagement is the business outcome we hope to achieve, we're wrong. The business outcome we hope to achieve is profit. Engagement is one way to get there. There are probably 17 others. Values are not the things we print on posters and advertise. Values are the things we're not willing to sacrifice to achieve the goals. And metrics need to be a way that we measure both of those things. Usually, we're using them just for the first. And so the, the second one has a pretty weak case to be made for it. If values are going to hold up to, me to metrics, we need to measure those as well. So let me give you a couple of examples, right? If my goal is to see the top of Mount Kilimanjaro and hike up that, well, a lot of teams would say, we're going to measure your resting heart rate or your VO2 max with your watch, because that's easy to measure. But is my cardiovascular fitness the best predictor of whether I'll succeed hiking up Kilimanjaro or not? Maybe. Maybe a better predictor would be how long I can hike today without falling down in exhaustion, right? That might be harder to measure, but it's probably a better predictor. So if we talk about the goal and not jumping just to the metric, we're going to pick a better metric that's a better predictor for us. Talking about the goal explicitly also helps us open up to a wider range of solutions. Let's say that our goal is to buy a house. There are a lot of solutions to that, right? We can save a lot of money by you know, sacrificing other things in our lives. We could inherit money from a rich relative if we have any. I'm still trying to find mine. Uh, we could win the lottery if we ever bought lottery tickets. We could rob a bank. There's lots of opinions uh, about what we could do, right? There's tons of options. Values tell us which of those options are just not OK, OK? Values limit our solutions a little bit, appropriately. So if one of our values is not breaking the law, OK, robbing a bank is out, right? So if our goal is to buy a house, our limiting value is to follow the law, and our metric is money in the bank. But we never want to forget that the goal is buying the house. Because if that money is just accumulating in the bank, that doesn't do anything for us. So let me give you a real world example. One of my clients, a company called Patients Like Me in Boston. Um, so Stephen Haywood, the gentleman in the wheelchair there, uh, was diagnosed with ALS. This is Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a degenerative nerve disorder. And it is typically fatal within about five years. It has no cure. There's very little treatment. And it's pretty horrible, the progression, right? People tend to lose their mobility. Uh, they lose their ability to talk. Eventually, they stop being able to breathe. And so what's really going on in this community of patients is that they're all self-experimenting. They're trying things, hoping to extend their life or their quality of life. And so Stephen's brothers, Ben and Jamie in the picture, said, you know what? Everybody's doing this. Why don't we turn it into real medical research and use it to work toward a cure? And so they built a social network where patients could share solutions today and collect structured medical data that would be credible to the medical establishment. And guess what? They proved that lithium, as a treatment for ALS, doesn't work before the clinical trial did. So you can't argue that this is not a patient-centered company, right? But they came to me and they said, Kim, our hearts are in the right place, but our user experience kind of sucks. Why is that? And so I started looking at how they were making decisions. So their goal, the thing that they were really focused on was getting the data to analyze, to work toward figuring out what works, what treatments work for people and why. And the metric they were focused on was data density. It turns out when you put a bunch of scientists in a room, 
they're greedy about data. They want to know more about everybody. And yet on the other side, you have sick people who have limited time and energy, and they're like, whoa, enough. Stop asking me this stuff. And so one of the things that we did based on some ethnography was um, we came up with a set of design principles. We codified the values. We said, what are the things we don't want to sacrifice in order to achieve this goal? One of those, for example, was let me feel in control as a patient. When you're sick, life feels really out of control. So could we, on patients like me, help that experience feel in your control, at least, and ideally help you feel more in control as a patient? And so one of the design decisions that came out of this value was anytime patients like me asks you a question on a monthly basis about how you're feeling, how you're doing, there's now a, another option there, which is a little hard to read on this slide, but it says, stop asking me this. Right? So it says, how are you feeling in this way? And you can just say, ugh, go away. I never want to answer this again. So what happens is every time a new research scientist joins the team, they're like, what? Patients can stop asking this? You're making my life harder. And I say, yeah, we are. Because that's the value. You see, it's not actually a value if you don't apply it when it's inconvenient, right? If you give it up when it starts to be a little painful, yeah, that's just marketing. We don't want to just do marketing. We want real values that are going to drive our team's decision making, okay? And that's why I say values are what you're not willing to sacrifice. So metrics need to be how we measure both the goal and the values, because otherwise, you know, metrics feel concrete and quantitative and convincing. And if all we have to put up against that is, well, users won't like it as much, uh, yeah, that's pretty weak. So, if our goal at patients like me is to get enough data to do the science, measuring data density is perfectly fine. That helps us understand if we're making progress toward the goal, but we need to balance that. If our value is to help patients feel in control, what we need to do is figure out how to measure that. And it's a little bit harder. We can't just instrument that in the analytics. What we actually have to do is ask. And this is the difficulty with values-based metrics. We almost always have to ask people how, they are, how we're doing. Now, Facebook every once in a while says, hey, Kim, do you believe Facebook cares about you? Yeah, that's not what I mean. Because we all know Facebook doesn't care about us. It's a piece of software. Instead, it could ask us better questions. So patients like me, we asked how many people felt more in control or more able to talk to their doctors or felt like the questions were relevant and helpful to them. We put that in, uh, in the questionnaires to start seeing if we were actually making the right decisions. So if Mark Zuckerberg says Facebook is about making humans feel more connected to other humans, which he said many times, I don't think Facebook measures that. Imagine if Facebook looked at the impact on Maslow's hierarchy, and they said, how could we measure the connectedness of human beings to each other? Well, you might look at things like, do they actually feel more connected to others after you use Facebook? Do you feel better about your friends? Or do you wonder if they're decent people? Do you feel valued by other people? Or do you think, wow, there's a lot of people out there who hate people like me? Do you value other people more because you've seen that they're actually humans who are a lot like you instead of people who are very different. Those are the kinds of things we should be measuring if, in fact, connecting other humans is one of our values. Those are not going to be easy to measure, but I think it could start leading to some different kinds of product decisions. Because I think that until we learn how to measure the things we value, we're going to overvalue and over-optimize for the things we measure. And that is metric-centered design. That's pulling us away from human-centered decisions. And that's helping us not make the world a better place for humans. So we've got to figure this one out. So I think we're all here to be more human-centered. Regardless of what we call ourselves as designers or researchers or product managers or you know, whatever your job is, who cares? I define my community as anybody who wants to fix those problems. So I think if we can agree with our teams and our clients on what human-centered means and start to use that as, that as a foundation for conversation, if we can adopt explicit values, and I would suggest starting with the Nuremberg Code, P2, 
people have been using that successfully for a long time. And if we start to change our relationship with metrics, right, never accept a metric as the goal. Always ask what it supports. And never use just one naked metric. Always use two together, right? The business goal metric and the values metric. Don't put up one without the other. I think we can start to change the conversation. It's not easy. It's going to take some convincing. But I think this can start to give us some new tools. Thanks for listening. Let's see what questions you have. Thank you. Turn this up a little. Hey. Hi, Kim. Here. I can hear. <laughs> Who am I talking to? Here. <laughs> Here. Ah. Here. Okay, I see you. Okay, so uh, I liked very much the, the speech and everything. Uh, I'd like to know uh, since to, to build a Nuremberg, Nuremberg code, we have to stop and do it now. What do you think that we can do before uh, we plan something or design th something that harm the whole humanity and that's no turn back or something like that? Uh, we can build an ethic code or we can stop and build a Nuremberg code. What do you think that we can do that's yeah. the best? Uh, I think, you know, for us as an industry and across many industries to adopt a Nuremberg code officially, that's a tall order, right? I think some of this may be imposed on us in different companies by regulation if we don't start to do some of it ourselves. What I think we can do as individual designers, let's say you're not even a manager, right? What if you bring the Nuremberg Code to your team as a conversation piece and say, hey, you know, I've been thinking about this as a way to examine our own practices. What do we think we do that meets these principles? What do we do that maybe doesn't meet these principles? And I think that's a starting point, because if, if your team can start to go, huh, you know, I've always felt a little squishy about that. Now I have some language to put on it, and maybe we should stop that. So I, I think if we can start to use this just to reflect on our own work, that's a beginning. Okay, what else? Anybody? I know, questions in the last talk of the day, everybody's like, get me to the Caipariñas, please. Oh. All right, over Oi. here? Yes, I see you. I will ask in Portuguese. Ask in Portuguese. I believe that this type of change, to be real inside of the corporations, it has to be top-down. It has to be coming from C-level to be able to happen and function. Do you think there is some action, like Frontline, people who are in the day-to-day development, can be made to evolve this discussion? Yes. Um, so, I agree that for any kind of meaningful culture change to happen in an organization, you do need support at the top. Um, there is a model of change that says change begins with an evangelist, someone who advocates for it, and in many cases that's us. The next step in making a change real is typically um, someone with authority to say, yes, make it so and to drive that into the company and to dedicate resources to it. And so, as designers, we often find ourselves stalled at that stage. And so what we can start to do is we can build momentum from the bottom. I find that every successful organizational change initiative I've worked in, and I mostly focus on that with companies, starts at the bottom with building allies among the developers and the product managers and the other people you work with. And then as you start to build allies, more starts to get communicated up the organization chart. And the other thing you do is you look among your executives and you say, who is it going to be a supporter? And you think about them as a user of your communication, right? Think about their behavior. Think about how they absorb information. And in a way, design a persuasion campaign just for them because you want to make sure you're reaching that person. And then once you start to build that support, you can eventually get to that point that you get top-down support. Now, organizational change is hard. Getting that executive mandate can be a matter of several years to get to that point. And so what you do is you get support from your peers, 
and you celebrate those small victories. And you come to places like this just to realize, oh my god, I am not crazy. Other people are doing the same thing, right? And also to recognize that your company is not more broken than anybody else. They're all just differently broken. Uh, because humans are just like that, right? So you're right. It will take a while. You will need executive support. But there are ways to sort of work both ends against that middle. Okay. Next question, anyone? Let's see. Over this way. Ah, OK. Hi. Hi. Uh, how do you start this conversation? I mean, yeah. uh, I'm in the office. I have to start this. I have to say, well, I, I don't like this. We can't change this. How do you start this Okay. without being out of my shop? <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it can feel awkward to start these conversations. It's, it's a risk to say this, because you don't want your colleagues to feel like you're judging them and saying, oh, I think you're all bad people because we're doing this, because that's not the case. I think you can, you can start by looking at, for example, where have you made a decision that maybe, hmm, you would have liked to make differently, and say, I've been reflecting on this thing that I did or that I was part of. I have a different way of thinking about it now. What do you think about this case? Uh, and, and just start to introduce that as a conversation in a non-judgmental way. It's not easy, but I, I think that's a good start. But it definitely, if you jump in with judgment, yeah, that's not going to be a win for you, right? Okay. Anyone else? Over here? Over here. Yeah. I can't hear. Okay. Uh, okay. Ready? Okay. You mentioned that you feel like uh, GDPR is not hard enough. Uh, what would you say would be uh, appropriate, effective uh, policies by, uh, by the government? Um, well, that's me presuming that I know how to do government policy, which I don't. Um, <laughs> uh, I will say that my comment was meant to say that what I see people doing with GDPR is they're implementing the letter of the law. In other words, they're interpreting it as narrowly and in as limited a way as they can. And so what it means is they're just, they're taking a bunch of text and throwing up walls of text at people and putting a bunch of check boxes in front of people just to read the news. And that's in some ways making the user experience much worse. When the intent to protect people's data privacy is there, what I would really wish they would do instead is to say, gosh, if we want people to look at our site and read our ads, do we actually need to collect all this information about them? Maybe we need to find a different model. And, and people aren't doing that kind of self-reflection that I can see in those implementations. They're just throwing a bunch of even worse stuff into the user experience. So that's what I mean. But how to fix that? Mm, yeah, that's one of those things that takes lots of expertise, including user experience, but uh, also policy folks. Anyone else? Behind you. Behind me. All right. Over yes. here. Thank you. I have a tough one. All right. Bring it on. Hey, probably the last one. Um, we practice, like you described it, our industry is helping to uh, put a democracy under siege everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I know that. It's very far from our day-to-day -day business, but uh, I think that we need to have to think about it because we, we are talking about co-creating everything and why not co-creating democracy? Yeah. In the morning, we discuss it like uh, to make EXGA more democratic in mm -hmm. some way. Maybe it's a start if we are thinking globally mm -hmm. and well, yeah. I would like to hear your thoughts on all that. Sure. Um, well, I, I think our industry is affecting democracy in a couple of different ways. Um, I think the, the design world is affecting democracy in really good ways in a lot of places because um, I don't know the landscape here in Latin America, but in the UK, in the United States, in Australia, um, there are a lot of designers getting involved in local and federal government to help make government just more humane. And it's not sexy design problems. It's making forms better. It's making websites more accessible. It's using plain language. But those not very sexy designs are making a tremendous difference for everyday citizens. So one is I think we can look at 
what is the actual benefit in the world, not how cool do I feel drawing this journey map, right? I think we can maybe approach our evaluation of the interestingness of a problem in a different way. I think design is also affecting democracy in things like social networks, right? And thinking about um, how is our product helping us perceive other people badly? Um, and that's where I think we can start to propose those different metrics. So, for example, if you are able to conduct some user research, do you have to ask somebody's permission for all of the questions that you ask? I doubt it. Just ask. Start asking people qualitatively. Spend a little more time. Ask a couple of those questions quantitatively next time you do a study. And if you find something interesting from that, say, hey, you know, we say we're about people feeling connected, but ever since we made this change, look what happened over here. And start to bring in that kind of evidence just the same way you would bring in other user research evidence. That's what I would suggest as a starting point. And it's going to take a long time. And we're not going to fix the world alone. But I think, you know, if we all work on our part of the solution, we'll, we'll help. Okay. All right. I'm going to guess you would all like to wrap up now. So thank you much.